Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going to go over the Come Follow Me lesson from March 16th through 22nd, 2020. This is covering Jacob 5 through 7. And now, let me introduce the star of the show, the scriptures. Yay, oh, so scriptures. Nice to have the scriptures here. So good. And now let's check with the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 33 minutes, 15 seconds. I can do that. Not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a whole week. All right. Yeah. We can do that. You got a, you got a whole week. Come on, everybody. To do it. We can do it. So let's jump into Jacob chapter 5. This is well known as the longest single chapter in the Book of Mormon. It's covering a, a very well known allegory of the uh, olive vineyard. And I thought I wanted to give you a little bit of background as far as uh, the, the great deep symbolism and using specifically an olive tree for this analogy. There was a great couple of paragraphs that I found in the old, uh, well, previous uh, Institute Manual for the Book of Mormon. This was Come on, published it's in old. 1989. It's yeah, that 89. No, okay, Come on now, that's old. <laughs> All right. The curriculum authors had put together a couple of paragraphs on, on uh, describing the olive tree, its symbolism, and, and its cultivation. They say, quote, There's further symbolic significance in the cultivation of an olive tree. If the green slip of an olive tree is merely planted and allowed to grow— it develops into the wild olive, a bush that grows without control into a tangle of limbs and branches, producing only a small, worthless fruit. To become the productive, tame olive tree, the main stem of the wild olive tree must be cut back completely and a branch from the tame olive tree grafted into the stem of the wild one. With careful pruning and cultivating, the tree will begin to produce its fruit, first fruit in about seven years. It will not become fully productive for nearly 15 years. In other words, the olive tree cannot become productive by itself. It requires grafting by the husbandman to bring it into production. Throughout its history, Israel has demonstrated the remarkable aptness characterized by the, sim the symbol of the olive tree. When they give themselves to their God for pruning and grafting, the Israelites prospered and bore much fruit. But when they turned from Christ, the master of the vineyard, and sought to become their own source of life and sustenance, they became wild and unfruitful. Two other characteristics of the olive tree further illustrate how it is an appropriate symbol for Israel. First, Though requiring nearly 15 years to come into full production, an olive tree may produce fruit for centuries. Some trees now growing in the Holy Land have been producing fruit abundantly for the, at least 400 years. The second amazing quality of the tree is that it, as it finally grows old and begins to die, the roots send up a number of new green shoots that, if grafted and pruned, will mature into full-grown olive trees. The root of the tree will also send up shoots after the tree is cut down. Thus, while the tree itself may produce fruit for centuries, the root of the tree may go on producing fruit for, and new trees for millennia. It is believed that some of the ancient olive trees located in Israel today have come from trees that were ancient during Christ's mortal ministry. How can Israel be compared to an olive tree, which time and again seems to have been cut down and destroyed, yet each time a new tree springs forth from the roots, end quote. Now, in covering the allegory of Zenos in chapter 5, John and I would like to uh, read an abridged version of it, and we'll have some visuals that will help you to walk through it. But the Come Follow Me manual has provided a PDF document, a chart, where they've updated the Institute graphic with much better images than the original um, uh, Institute chart on that. And this can be a really good reminder to help to you to walk through and uh, simplify the main elements of, of the allegory.
I will liken thee, O house of Israel, like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard. And it grew and waxed old and began to decay. And it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth, and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. And he said, I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it, that perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches, and it perish not. And it came to pass that after many days it began to put forth somewhat a little young and tender branches. But behold, the main top thereof began to perish. And the master saw it, and he said unto his servant, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Wherefore go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree, and bring them hither unto me. And we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away, and we will cast them into the fire, that they may be burned. And behold, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. And it mattereth not that if it so be that the root of the tree will perish, I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. And it came to pass that the servant grafted in the branches of the wild olive tree. And the Lord of the vineyard caused that it should be digged about and pruned and nourished. Go thy way, watch the tree and nourish it according to my words. And these will I place in the nethermost part of my vineyard, whithersoever I will, it mattereth not unto thee. And I do it that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree, and also that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself, for it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. And it came to pass that a long time passed away, and the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard, that we may labor in the vineyard. Behold, look here, behold the tree. Behold, the branches of the wild olive tree have taken hold of the moisture of the root thereof, and the root thereof hath brought forth much strength. And because of the much strength of the root thereof, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. Now, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. And now, behold, I shall lay up much fruit, which the tree thereof hath brought forth. Come. Let us go to the nethermost part of the vineyard, and behold if the natural branches of the tree have not brought forth much fruit also. And it came to pass that they went forth. And he beheld the first, that it had brought forth much fruit. And he beheld also that it was good. Take of the fruit thereof. For behold, this long time have I nourished it, and it hath brought forth much fruit. How comest thou hither to plant this branch of the tree? For behold, it was the poorest spot in all the land of thy vineyard. Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Wherefore I said unto thee, I have nourished it this long time, and thou beholdest that it hath brought forth much fruit. Look hither. Behold, I have planted another branch of the tree also, and thou knowest that this spot of ground was poorer than the first. But behold the tree. I have nourished it this long time, and it hath brought forth much fruit. Therefore gather it, and lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto mine own self. Look hither, and behold another branch also, which I have planted. Behold, I have nourished it also, and it hath brought forth fruit. Look hither, and behold the last. Behold, this have I planted in a good spot of ground, and I have nourished it this long time, and only a part of the tree hath brought forth tame fruit, and the other part of the tree hath brought forth wild fruit. Behold, I have nourished this tree like unto the others. Pluck off the branches that have not brought forth good fruit, and cast them into the fire. Let us prune it, and dig about it, and nourish it a little longer, that perhaps it may bring forth good fruit unto thee. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did nourish all the fruit of the vineyard. And it came to pass that a long time had passed away. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard, that we may labor again in the vineyard. For behold, the time draweth near, and the end soon cometh. Wherefore, I must lay up fruit against the season unto mine own self. 
And they came to the tree whose natural branches had been broken off, and the wild branches had been grafted in. And behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber the tree. Behold, this long time have we nourished this tree, and I have laid up unto myself against the season much fruit. But behold, this time it hath brought forth much fruit, and there is none of it which is good. And behold, there are all kinds of bad fruit, and it profiteth me nothing, notwithstanding all our labor. And now it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. What shall we do unto the tree, that I may preserve again good fruit thereof unto mine own self? Behold, because thou didst graft in the branches of the wild olive tree, they have nourished the roots, that they are alive, and they have not perished. Wherefore, thou beholdest that they are yet good. I know that the roots are good, and for mine own purpose I have preserved them. And because of their much strength they have hitherto brought forth from the wild branches good fruit. But behold, the wild branches have grown and have overrun the roots thereof, and hath brought forth much evil fruit, that it beginneth to perish, and it will soon become ripened, that it may be cast into the fire, except we should do something for it to preserve it. Let us go down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard, and behold if the natural branches have also brought forth evil fruit. And it came to pass that they went down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard, and they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become corrupt also, yea, the first and the second and also the last. And they had all become corrupt. And the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which had brought forth good fruit, even that the branch had withered away and died. What could I have done more for my vineyard? Behold, all the trees of my vineyard are good for nothing, save it to be hewn down and cast into the fire. And behold, this last, whose branch hath withered away, I did plant in a good spot of ground, yea, even that which was choice unto me above all other parts of the land of my vineyard. And thou beheldest that I also cut down that which cumbered this spot of ground, that I might plant this tree in the stead thereof. And thou beheldest that a part thereof brought forth good fruit, and a part thereof brought forth wild fruit. And because I plucked not the branches thereof and cast them into the fire, behold, they have overcome the good branch, that it hath withered away. And now behold... Notwithstanding all the care we have taken of my vineyard, the trees thereof have become corrupted, that they bring forth no good fruit, and these I had hoped to preserve. It grieveth me that I should lose them. But what could I have done more in my vineyard? Have I slackened mine hand, that I have not nourished it? Nay, I have nourished it. And I have digged about it, and I have pruned it, and I have dunged it, and I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long, and the end draweth nigh, and it grieveth me that I should hew down all the trees of my vineyard, and cast them into the fire, that they should be burned. Who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? Is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? Have not the branches thereof overcome the roots, which are good? Behold, they grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Behold, I say, is not this the cause that the trees of thy vineyard have become corrupted? Let us go to and hew down the trees of the vineyard, and cast them into the fire, that they shall not cumber the ground of my vineyard, for I have done all. What could I have done more for my vineyard? Spare it a little longer? Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. Wherefore, let us take of the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost parts of my vineyard, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came. And let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit is most bitter, and graft in the natural branches of the tree in the stead thereof. And behold, 
The roots of the natural branches of the tree, which I planted whithersoever I would, are yet alive. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree, that when they shall be sufficiently strong, perhaps they may bring forth good fruit unto me, and I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. Pluck not the wild branches from the trees, save it be those which are most bitter, and in them ye shall graft according to that which I have said. And this I do, that perhaps the roots thereof may take strength because of their goodness, and because of the change of the branches, that the good may overcome the evil. And perhaps that I may rejoice exceedingly that I have preserved the roots and the branches of the first fruit. Wherefore, go to and call servants, that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard, that we may prepare the way, that I may bring forth again the natural fruit, which natural fruit is good, and the most precious above all other fruit. Wherefore, let us go and labor with our might this last time, for behold, the end draweth nigh, and this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. Graft in the branches, and dig about the trees, both old and young, the first and the last, and the last and the first, that all may be nourished once again for the last time. And if it so be that these last grafts shall grow, and bring forth natural fruit, then shall ye prepare the way for them, that they may grow. Wherefore ye shall clear away the bad according as the good shall grow, that the root and the top may be equal in strength, until the good shall overcome the bad, and the bad shall be hewn down and cast into the fire, that they cumber not the ground of my vineyard. And thus will I sweep away the bad out of my vineyard. And the servant went, and did as the Lord had commanded him, and brought other servants, and they were few. And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their mites, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them, and they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. And there began to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard. And the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. And the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away. And they did keep the root and the top thereof equal, according to the strength thereof. And thus they labored with all their diligence, even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard. And the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. And they became like unto one body, and the fruits were equal. Behold, for this last time have we nourished my vineyard, and thou beholdest that I have done according to my will. And I have preserved the natural fruit that it is good, even like as it was in the beginning. And blessed art thou. For because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in my vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, that my vineyard is no more corrupted, and the bad is cast away, behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. And when the time cometh that evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered, and the good will I preserve unto myself, and the bad will I cast away into its own place. And then cometh the season and the end. Well, we hope you enjoyed that narration. I hope it's uh, helped clarify the allegory. Uh, it is a masterwork of, of Scripture and one of the most fascinating uh, elements of the Book of Mormon, largely because it comes from a prophet that we don't really know a whole lot about. Zenos uh, w clearly had writings that were on the uh, plates of brass, but we don't have them today other than through the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and this won't be the last time we'll be hearing from Zenos either. Uh, he's quoted True. by others, and uh, we'll get some more of his prophecies uh, as we go along. So let's go on to chapter 6. Chapter 6. Sounds great. Well, at the beginning of, so chapter six is, and Jacob doesn't give us as much as we might want, but he does give us some interpretation of the allegory of Zenos in chapter six. That phrase in verse two of the last time that he will come and recover his people, that's an exciting time in the allegory and for us today, because we are in that time period. That's our time period, and the servants of the Lord will go forth, he says, in power 
to nourish and prune the vineyard. And if you are willing to serve the Savior as his disciple, then that's you. In verse 3, And how blessed are they who have labored diligently in his vineyard, and how cursed are they who shall be cast out into their own place. And the world shall be burned with fire. And how merciful is our God unto us, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches. And he stretches forth his hands unto them all the day long. And they are a stiff-necked and a gainsaying people. But as many as will not harden their hearts shall be saved in the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to look at a parallel for that, but if we want to look at those verses, and John, if you want to read the next two, look for a parallel there, or not a parallel, what am I trying to say? A, um, a comparison. Sure. In this case, we have those who will not harden their hearts will be saved, and let's see what the opposite is. Right. If you don't harden your hearts, in verse 5, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech you in words of soberness that you would repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And while his arm of mercy is extended towards you in the light of the day, of the day harden not your hearts. Yea, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for why will ye die? Listen to that pleading. Does that not say to you, choose life? <laughs> it, yes. You know, why are you going to die? Choose yeah. life. Yeah. And that it's up to us. I, I really, I noticed this time the word cleave uh, mm. in verse five, full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. Adam and Eve, that's the first, you know, kind of cleaving. A, a man will cleave unto his wife and none else. Uh, mm-hmm. The relationship in the Old Testament is is constantly describing that marriage relationship between God's people and him. And yet they cheat on him and they, they, they treat him badly. And this encouragement to cleave just like we would to our spouse, cleave unto God, he will cleave unto us. And that arm of mercy there and that phrase in verse uh, at the end of verse five, in the light of day. His mercy is extended toward you in the light of day. If you want to, you could take a look at Alma 34, 33, where we have a a, kind of an expanded idea of that phrase. I beseech of you that you do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, light of day, uh, which is given unto you to prepare for eternity, behold, if ye do not improve your time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. This mercy is extended to us in the light of day. Take advantage of it and don't harden your hearts. Why will you die? Why will ye die? Choose life. Choose life. And behold, after ye have been nourished by the good word of God, that that word is used in uh, to great effect in the allegory, we think about nourishing a tree. Now he's talking to us about being nourished with the good word of God. What does that mean to be nourished? How do we draw nourishment from the good word of God? Have you had those experiences? Are you feeling right now like maybe you're not getting as much out as you used to? What's the difference How can we get more? How can we be nourished by the good word of God? How can we get it in us? Good questions to ask ourselves. So in the next few verses, starting with verse 8, Behold, will ye reject these words? Will ye reject the words of the prophets? And will ye reject all the words which have been spoken concerning Christ after so many have spoken concerning him? And deny the good word of Christ and the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost and quench the Holy Ghost and make a mock of the great plan of redemption which hath been laid for you? Know ye not that if ye will do these things that the power of the redemption and the resurrection which is in Christ will bring you to stand with shame and awful guilt before the bar of God? And according to the power of justice, for justice cannot be denied, ye must go away into that lake of fire and brimstone, whose flames are unquenchable. 
and whose smoke ascendeth up for ever and ever, which lake of fire and brimstone is endless torment. You know, the Institute Manual has a, a handy quote from uh, the history of the church. This is uh, the B.H. Roberts uh, history of the uh, seven volume history of the church of Joseph Smith saying, quote, a man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of a man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone, end quote. Concept of uh, the scriptural description of a lake of fire and brimstone is our own self-awareness of what we could have become, what we had the opportunity to become. There's a phrase in here that I hadn't noticed before uh, in verse 8, and quench the Holy Spirit. I've never heard yeah. that in Scripture. And it reminds me of our beautiful hymn, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning. In the ancient world, that would have been the source of light. And then to quench that light in us. Again, that's that's a choice. That's, yep. You are actively doing something to ignore or or you know, well, put out quench, the influence of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, to quench is to take away what gives it power. If you're going to quench a fire, you know, you, you've got to take away its source of fuel, its air, those kinds of things. But whatever is giving the Holy Spirit light in us to quench that, that's quite a phrase. Well, and it, the implication is, is it's not just driving away the Spirit. It's quenching the Spirit, implying that it's not coming back. Yeah. You've severed ties with with yeah. the spirit at that point. That's powerful imagery. Very powerful. Oh, be wise. What can Indeed, I say more? There in the next few verses, and I love that verse, uh, but verse 11, Oh, then, my beloved brethren, repent ye, and enter in at the straight gate, and continue in the way which is narrow until ye shall obtain eternal life. And then as Jay so eloquently quoted, Oh, be wise. What can I say more? Finally, I bid you farewell until I shall meet you before the pleasing bar of God, which bar striketh the wicked with awful dread and fear. Amen. Now, a couple of points. Number one, uh, once again, Jacob really sounds like he's done, <laughs> but he's not. We've got one more chapter. I think, though, he thinks he's done. Yeah, and perhaps he does. Because I know? think he jumps back in with the incident in, in chapter seven, but... All right, fair enough. What, just a, a kind of an interesting scholarly debate where the Book of Mormon is concerned in this particular verse, verse thirteen. Shall meet before you, be, meet you before the pleasing bar of God. Royal Skousen, who has done some amazing work on uh, Book of Mormon analytics, uh, comparing the uh, original manuscript, the printer's manuscript, the uh, various editions of the Book of Mormon, continues to publish some just outstanding scholarship where this is concerned, has made an interesting case that while we have in our Book of Mormon the phrase, the pleasing bar of God, he suggests that it might actually have been the pleading bar of God. What's interesting, though, is that not too long after Royal Skousen published his article, uh, there was a pub an article published by John S. Welch as a counterargument saying, no, it should actually be pleasing bar. It, whether it's pleading or pleasing is really, you know, it's very nitpicky. It's kind of missing the whole point of the verse. But for those who might be interested in some uh, interesting scholarly debate, we'll include a uh, link on Fair Mormon that has uh, references to both uh, Royal Skousen's ar article and uh, John S. Welch, and uh, you know, let you decide for yourself. It's just kind of, it's interesting reading. Well, on to chapter 7. Chapter 7, what do we got? Well, to me it feels like Jacob opened the book again and said, you know what, I should really record this. Uh, since last I wrote, it came to pass that uh, some years had passed away, and there's a guy named Sherem. Now, there's... Hmm. A possibility here that uh, we've talked before about the fact that it's unlikely, uh, or at least we should be open to the possibility that when the family of Lehi arrived in the Americas, there were already people there. 
And there's a possibility that Cherim may have been part of an indigenous population that he had been looking for a long time to uh, to speak with Jacob. Now, it, it could also be that he was one of the people there. But there are some things to think about. He's coming declaring that there shall be no Christ. And he labored diligently that he might lead away the hearts of the people. And he did. He was very successful. He led away many hearts. And uh, knowing that I, Jacob, had faith in Christ, he sought opportunity, much opportunity. Now, if there's, you know, if it's a small group of people from Lehi's people, that's one thing people have asked the question of is why did, why didn't he just, you know, (laughs) there's only, you know, maybe there's 50 people there. So, I mean, why would, why would Hmm. it, uh, you not have an opportunity to, to come? The other is that it mentions he was learned and that he had a perfect knowledge of the language of the people. Now, it's possible that what he means is he had a perfect knowledge. He was a really good speaker. And it's also possible that he had really learned their language well, and as a result was able to use much flattery and power of speech. So, uh, worth a thought. This idea of describing our Antichrist here with these characteristics. He was learned. He had a perfect knowledge of the language. He used much flattery, power of speech. Uh, Robert Millett wrote an article that we'll link below, but for our purposes here, I've just summarized some points that he makes in the article that, speaking of using Sherem as a template, antichrists are people who deny the need for Jesus Christ. In other words, the Antichrist is a denial of man's fallen condition, and thus his need for anyone or anything to liberate him. And this has been something that Satan has been pushing since the beginning. In the pre-earth life, that time, Satan was making the case that we do not need a Christ. And he was very convincing to a third of the hosts of heaven. So it's something that has started long before and continues in this life. They use flattery to win disciples. People that use flattery are people that are students of human behavior. And maybe it's something they've put a lot of effort into, but often it's a charisma that they're born with that they use to persuade or to dissuade. uh, Or manipulate in either way. Yep. And they Mm. can be very good at it. Uh, They accuse the brethren of teaching false doctrine. This is the, the Sherem comes right to the source. Uh, Joseph Smith here offers a condemnation of those who stand up to condemn others. Uh, they have a limited view of reality. They don't see things as they really are. And Robert Millet uses this phrase, which I think is great. He's a scientist with insufficient data. His methodology <laughs> is limited by his approach, and his conclusions must surely be suspect. John had used this notion of the different ways that we take in truth. And if you only have a partial set of inputs, then you don't really want to trust your conclusions. No, there's a, a huge probability that you might have accidentally stumbled on truth, but how would you know? Yeah. You want to use your full faculties. Absolutely. And remember, that includes your physical senses, your intellectual uh, reasoning, and you, your spiritual, your, your revelation yep. and, and inspiration. Yep. So two more, they have a disposition to misread and thereby misrepresent the scriptures. And um, they're sign seekers. Uh, Robert Millet offers an interesting observation on that. He says, simply stated, those who have given themselves up to their lusts who desire that which will satiate the flesh, who have exhausted their passions in their search for the sensual, also seek for physical manifestations of spiritual sensations. That was an interesting way to think about it. Hmm. So anyways, uh, we'll link the article. You can read the whole thing if you're interested. Very nice. So in verse 5, we have the line, and he had hoped to shake me from the faith. This is uh, Jacob's referring to Sherem. Sherem had hoped to shake him from the faith. Notwithstanding the many revelations and the many things which I had seen concerning these things. For I truly had seen angels, and they administered unto me. And also 
I heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word from time to time, wherefore I could not be shaken. Now think about that for a minute. You've got, here is a powerful recording of Jacob has received some of the most penetrating spiritual confirmations of truth. Those are no longer up for debate and discussion. The opportunity for doubt is gone at that point. He has received direct truth from the source of all truth. And so that's why he couldn't be shaken. It didn't matter that maybe Jacob didn't know the language as well as Sherem. It didn't matter if Sherem had studied things that Jacob maybe had not. It's irrelevant. He received truth from the source of truth. Discussion over. To remind us, last week we talked about Jacob chapter 4, verse 6, where it talked about how the people became unshaken. We may not be able to relate to things such as seeing angels as Jacob did, but that kind of stuff doesn't necessitate that could not be shaken. There's chapter 4, verse 6. It gives a list that we can really relate to. And next week we'll talk about Enos. He will go through a set of things that we can really relate to. So it's it's not the necessarily the big things, but as John points out, he has connected himself with the source of truth, and he cannot be shaken. To go along a further uh, encouragement where this is concerned, from the Gospel Doctrine Manual, there's a quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith from Doctrines of Salvation, quote, There is not anything in this world of as great importance to us as obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us search these scriptures. Let us know what the Lord has revealed. Let us put our lives in harmony with this truth. Then we will not be deceived. End quote. Fantastic. Get your nose in the scriptures. You know, this is what it's all about. Get to know the truths that the Lord has to, sh- to share with you. Love it. So then we get into the debate, right? Yeah. Hey, do you want to like take parts here? You could be... Uh... Oh. Sherem, I could be Jacob. Yeah, let, or... let me be let me be Sherem. All right. I can be an arrogant jerk. Here we go. <laughs> All right, take it on. So, so we yeah. start in, in verse 6 here. Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you, for I have heard and also know that thou goest about much preaching that which ye call the gospel, or the doctrine of Christ. And ye have led away much of this people, that they pervert the right way of God. And keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way, and convert the law of Moses into the worship of a being which ye shall say, which ye say shall come many hundreds years hence. And now behold, I, Sherem, declare unto you that this is blasphemy. For no man knoweth of such things, for he cannot tell of things to come, and after this manner... Oh, Did now, Sherem contend? Yeah, yeah that's, so I, I missed that. That's, that's the narration. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the before we go on in the narration, let me just take a quick uh, aside here. A lot of times when people dogmatically uh, lay out their philosophy, you have to kind of pick apart the pieces to show, okay, which are actually supported and which are weakly supported, and which are, you know, out-and-out lies. Take a look at verse 7 there. You have the statement that that, uh, Jacob's led away much of this people, that they pervert the right way of God. Well, it's an extraordinarily arrogant statement, but it certainly is a matter of, of opinion, right? It's a matter of perception. That is really more of an opinion. And keep not the law of Moses... Okay, well, that's a lie. They do keep the law of Moses. And uh, then next line, and convert the law of Moses into the worship of a being ye shall say, ye, ye say shall come many hundreds years hence. Well, no, the law of Moses was always about this being that came, uh, would, would come many years hence. That was the whole point of the law of Moses. So that's also a false statement, a lie. Now I share and declare unto you that this is blasphemy for no man. Uh, the, by the way, the, declare, the declaration of blasphemy, that's also an opinion, right? It's based on the previous statements. For no man knoweth of such things. Well, no. At this point, we've had several people testifying of these things. Most recently, Nephi and Jacob. So, yeah, we got a lot of people knowing of such things. Well, right. You've got the scriptures and everything else, but also if no man can know of such things, how does he know? 
He uh, sounds good point. awfully confident. And he if certainly no man does. can know, then... then um, how can he know that no man can know? Ah, right. Well, now he's putting this. himself as someone who knows. Exactly. And where, in his, where is his authority? That's the kicker, you know. Keep in mind that uh, great verse from Isaiah that we studied earlier. Uh, Cease ye for man. For wherein is he to be accounted of? Where is his authority? Why does he mm-hmm. know? The very next line, for he cannot tell of things to come. That's his opinion, right? That's not a fact. That's his opinion. Before we go on, I wanted to include one really good quote from the Institute Manual. This is President Ezra Taft Benson from the October 1963 General Conference. He talks about three questions we can ask ourselves to avoid being deceived. Number one, what do the standard works have to say about it? The Book of Mormon, Brigham Young said, was written on the tablets of his heart and no doubt helped save him from being deceived. Number two, the second guide is what do the Latter-day presidents of the church have to say on the subject, particularly the living president? Number three, the third and final test is the Holy Ghost, the test of the Spirit. This test can only be fully effective if one's channels of communication with God are clean and virtuous and uncluttered with sin. Said Brigham Young, You may know whether you are led right or wrong, for every principle God has revealed carries its own convictions of its truth to the human mind. What a pity it would be if we were led by one man to utter destruction. End quote. I love that. I should point out that uh, while someone may be uh, critical of his statement, uh, his second statement to uh, what do the Latter-day presidents of the church have to say on the subject, let's bear in mind that this was at least two decades before he became president of the church. So he's not necessarily referring to himself. No, no, that's, uh, that's really important. All right, so let's go back to the chapter. They're, they're yeah, in verse so verse eight. 8, there's an interesting phrase, Behold, the Lord God poured in his spirit into my soul, insomuch that I did confound him in all his words. And I don't mean to interrupt us from ever getting through this chapter, but I have a quick anecdote. Uh, we don't often share these anecdotes, but I, I, hope, um, I hope you don't mind. When I was a missionary, I served in um, Salt Lake, and there was a fellow there who I contacted, and he was, I don't know, the most enthusiastic anti-Mormon I think I'd, I'd ever met. We set up an appointment to stop by his home. He warned us ahead of time. And I was, you know, toward the end of my mission, I was feeling pretty confident in my own skills. And I went in there and... Um, with my companion and he had an entire bookshelf not like a shelf but like a bookshelf filled with anti-mormon literature and so forth anyways he creamed me i just was taken to the cleaners for you know the next hour and i kind of you know crawled out of the apartment you know with my ego dragging behind me and but he said <laughs> before we left he said you want to set up another appointment and he said no missionaries ever come back and I, well, you know, I guess I had enough ego left because I was like, oh, no, we'll come back. We're, we'll be happy to come back. Inside, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? But I noticed something when I left. I had not prayed with my companion before we left the apartment. I had not prayed with my companion in the car before we went in. And when we went in to talk with him, I hadn't asked for a prayer before we started. And I didn't have a prayer in my heart. In other words, I said to the Lord, essentially, eh, I got this. You don't, you don't need to help me out. I, I can take care of this. Uh, well, I couldn't. So the appointment was the, was the next week, and I, I was absolutely scared to death to be just creamed again. It wasn't that I, there wasn't really anything for me to study. It wasn't about not knowing the things. I, I had just detached myself from the Lord. And so I spent the week repenting and striving for the spirit of the Lord. And when we left the apartment, we had a prayer. And when we were in our car, when we got to his apartment, we had a prayer. And when I got in there, he had invited a friend. He said, yeah, I thought you wouldn't mind if I invited my friend over. He knows a lot more than I do. And (laughs) so they kind of jumped, they kind of, you know, got right into it. And I said, hey, before we start, could, could we have a prayer? 
And his friend was kind of startled, but he said, yeah, that'd be great. So the, the guy whose apartment that was asked his friend, and he gave a very nice prayer. And then they started to launch into it and uh, had a question. I began to answer it. And they do. This was the tactic before. They interrupt you as you're, as you're in the process yeah. of answering. If you, th- if you think, yeah, if, you, if they think you know the answer, then they quickly They'll change Jump right the into something else. And that happened. He went right in. And I felt completely comfortable. I said, please don't interrupt me again until I finished answering your question. And he said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And this happened in verse 8. We confounded them in all their words. I didn't know anything more that next week than I knew the previous week. But we had with us the Spirit of the Lord. And that was remarkable. The Lord God poured in his Spirit. Uh, I felt it happen, especially since I could compare it to the absence of that. You had a frame of reference. Yes, I did. All right. Verse 9. Deniest thou the Christ who should come? If there should be a Christ, I would not deny him. But I know that there is no Christ, neither has been nor ever will be. Okay, to, we have to. to <laughs> aside, yeah, that yeah. is the most atheistic, or not, not, uh, not atheistic, agnostic statement that I've ever seen in the scriptures. And it's just, it's almost Notice hilarious. Connect it, John, with what we had at the end of seven. No man can know of such things. Look at his testimony in verse 9. It's wavering. Well, he says that I know there is no Christ, neither has been nor ever will be. His complaint before is that no man can know of things which are going to come. But he knows. he, He does. His testimony is that he knows. Well, but what's hilarious is that he's asserting that he knows, but right before then he's allowing himself an out. Yeah. If there was a, if there should be a Christ, I would not deny him. Okay, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of wonder if what he's saying there is, if Christ was standing right here, so I could see him with my physical senses, mm-hmm. then I, I'd believe. I wouldn't deny him if he was standing right in front of me. Which, which I would argue he still wouldn't. But you well, know, yeah, he's, he's allowing himself that out. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very agnostic approach of well, you know, I'm not saying that there isn't a God, but there isn't. Well, but then he turns around and says, I know there isn't. And that, of course, right. he previously said no man could know except him. Except Be- him. Believest thou the scriptures? Yea. Then ye do not understand them, for they truly testify of Christ. Behold, I say unto you that none of the prophets have written nor prophesied save they have spoken concerning this Christ. And this is not all. It has been made manifest unto me, for I have heard and seen. And it also has been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, I know if there should be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost. That is a remarkable testimony. Now, are you speaking uh, as Sherem? This is, Wouldn't no. that be great if that's what Sherem said? No. <laughs> Sherem would not say that. Oh. Uh, at least not yet. <laughs> no, I wanted to do a quick aside. Sorry, I should have, I should have said. No, no. But you're right to say that because he, he talks about he's seen and heard, but then— But then he calls out the power specifically of the, Holy Ghost. the power of the Holy Ghost. This yeah. is someone who has seen Jehovah. Has talked to Jehovah one on one. We already discussed that, right? He's one of the he and Nephi and Isaiah are witnesses, are direct witnesses of of Jesus Christ, and yet he singles out the testimony of the Holy Ghost. How how important is that? You know. Okay, so then we go on, right? Verse thirteen. Show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost in which ye know so much. He's so snotty. He is. And, I, you know, quick quick aside where that's concerned, Bruce R. McConkie has made a statement in, in uh, Mormon Doctrine. I pulled this out of the Institute Manual. Quote, signs flow from faith. They may incidentally have the effect of strengthening the faith of those who are already spiritually inclined, but their chief purpose is not to convert people to the truth, but to reward and bless those already converted 
Signs are sacred grants of divine favor reserved for the faithful and concerning which the recipients are commanded not to boast, end quote. He probably shouldn't have asked for one then. No, no. This is a, a classic example of be careful what you wish for. All right. Uh, so let's go on. What am I that I should tempt God to show unto thee a sign in the thing which thou knowest to be true, yet thou wilt deny it? because thou art of the devil. Slam. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but if God shall smite thee, let that be a sign unto thee, that he has power both in heaven and in earth, and also that Christ shall come. And thy will, O Lord, be done, and not mine. And then we have the results. The results are that uh, as soon as he spoke in these words, the power of the Lord came upon him, insomuch that Sherem fell to the earth, and it came to pass that he was nourished for the space of many days, but then he called. Called uh, to, the to the people and say, gather, gather together on the morrow, for I shall die. Wherefore, I desire to speak unto the people before I shall die. So and, everybody. You know, then on the morrow, he, he speaks plainly unto them and, and denies the things which he had, had taught them and confesses Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and the ministering of angels. He spake plainly unto them, you know, so he's using his power of speech that, you know, he, he had evidently, uh, that he had been deceived by the power of the devil, and he spake of hell and of eternity and eternal punishment. And he said there in verse 19, I fear lest I have committed the unpardonable sin, for I have lied unto God, for I denied the Christ and said that I believe the scriptures, and they truly testify of him. And because I have thus lied unto God, I greatly fear, lest my case shall be awful, but I confess unto God. And that's the end of Sherem. He gave up the ghost, and the multitude were astonished exceedingly. In verse 21, they were overcome that they fell to the earth. And that's something that we're going to see happening later in the Book of Mormon as well, people being overwhelmed and falling to the earth. Uh, mm. What's interesting to me is in 23, what they did to counteract what they'd been taught, uh, the lies that they'd been from taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Sherem. In 23, it came to pass that the peace and the love of God was restored again among the people. And they searched the scriptures and hearkened no more to the words of this wicked man. And if you'll recall, that was President or Elder Benson's at the time uh, recommendation. That was his first thing to yeah. do, to avoid being deceived. What do the standard works have to say about it? What well, we've got, some, we've got some other resources, too. We've talked about these before, but let me just uh, review briefly. If you're in your Gospel Library app um, or on the church website, uh, go to Gospel Topics. Uh, there are both general topics. There are the Gospel Topics essays, which are longer format explanations of hot-button issues. There are the church history topics, which are shorter essays on a huge variety of church history topics. But we also introduced this uh, because the link is long and it takes a while to get you here. I'm just going to put it in the description. But the gospel study resources is something that the church had put together for uh, seminary teachers. And it's got a list of church affiliated resources as well as, uh, and some of these that I would point out there's a lot of them. BYU Studies is one that I don't know if a lot of people know about. It's a lot of great articles. You can't access the newest issue. You, you can pay for it, but the other ones are all free, and you can just search for topics, and there's a lot of great uh, things in there. The Encyclopedia of Mormonism and uh, The Religious Educator is another uh, magazine that could be really useful. Those are all church resources, church-affiliated. But then there's other resources. We talked about that with the Webster's Dictionary uh, in our first episode. But look, Book of Mormon Central, we've talked about them, Fair Mormon, Joseph Smith's Polygamy. John talked about that last episode. Mormon Scholars Testify, Interpreter Foundation. All great resources to find information uh, that the church recommends is something to be useful, even though they're not affiliated with the church. Yeah. So check them out. Well, and here's another thing to think about just in the, the Sherem story before we completely leave it. The scriptures aren't really clear on what happened to Sherem. He, you know, it, it wasn't a situation necessarily where he was struck dumb or, you know. Or he died an ignominious death. 
Right, exactly. He didn't do that, at least, you know, not not <laughs> They didn't call not, it out. Not in that verbiage, yes. Yeah. But, you know, obviously Jacob didn't feel that it was important. And, you know, at the end of the day, it really isn't. But he was smitten in such a way that he totally backtracked. He totally dropped any pretense that the gospel was false. Uh, so I don't know what exactly happened to him, but it obviously was pretty powerful to the point where, uh, well, it eventually killed him, but also you know, that he was afraid for his own soul at this point. He he felt that maybe he had betrayed the Holy Ghost or committed the unpardonable sin. I suspect not. I mean, it seemed like he didn't really understand the gospel. But he recognized that he went against what he knew to be true for his own selfish purposes. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. So then Jacob wraps it up here. Last uh, two verses. And it came to pass that I, Jacob, began to be old. And the record of this people being kept on the other plates of Nephi, wherefore I conclude this record, declaring that I have written according to the best of my knowledge by saying that the time passed away with us and also our lives passed away, like as it were unto us a dream. We being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation in a wilderness and hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions, wherefore we did mourn out our days. And I, Jacob, saw that I must soon go down to my grave, wherefore I said unto my son Enos, Take these plates. And I told him the things which my brother Nephi had commanded me, and he promised obedience unto the commandments, and I make an end of my writing upon these plates, which writing has been small. And to the reader I bid farewell, hoping that many of my brethren may read my words. Brethren, adieu. Now, I should point out that there are several critics of the Book of Mormon who found it odd that the French word adieu appears in an English translation of Scripture. There have been many discussions about this back and forth. Uh, There's actually a really good article covering a lot of the different uh, approaches to that discussion in Fair Mormon. We'll post that on on the video. But here's one that I took, I believe, out of the Institute Manual. This is from the October 1985 uh, Enzyme, an article called I Have a Question, you know, probably uh, an article filled with questions. This answer was given by Edward J. Brandt, quote, The choice of words came through the manner of the language of Joseph Smith so that we might have understanding. This is why words not known in the Book of Mormon times are found in the translated text. The word adieu is defined in a dictionary of Joseph Smith's day as a farewell, an expression of kind wishes at the parting of friends, meaning that I commend you to God. This is from the 1828 uh, Webster's Dictionary. While the word is of French origin, it had found common usage in early 19th century New England, end quote. Uh, So was it common verbiage of the day? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and it's not like we don't have words from German and French and Mm -hmm. lots of other languages that have made their way into ours. But, yeah, I think that's a really nice nice way to end. Well, in closing, there are some words from Elder Uchtdorf, which was from a recent broadcast to the young single adults. And it was, I think it's a really profound message about our sources for truth. And so we'll, uh, we'll share that as we wrap up our episode. What about doubts and questions in principle? How do you find out that the gospel is true? Is it all right to have questions about the church or its doctrine? My dear young friends, we are a question-asking people. We have always been, because we know that inquiry leads to truth. That is the way how the church got its start, from a young man who had questions. In fact, I'm not sure how one can discover truth without asking questions. In the scriptures, you will rarely discover a revelation that didn't come in response to a question. Whenever a question arose and Joseph Smith 
wasn't sure of the answer, he approached the Lord. And the result are the wonderful revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants. Often the knowledge Joseph received extended far beyond the original question. That is because not only can the Lord answer the questions we ask, but even more importantly, he can give us answers to questions we should have asked. Let us listen to those answers. The missionary effort of the Church is founded upon honest investigators asking heartfelt questions. Inquiry is the birthplace of testimony. Some might feel embarrassed or unworthy because they have searching questions regarding the gospel, but they needn't feel that way. Asking questions isn't a sign of weakness. It's a precursor of growth. God commands us to seek answers to our questions and ask only that we seek with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ. When we do so, the truth of all things can be manifest to us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Fear not, ask questions, be curious, but doubt not. Doubt not. Always hold fast to faith and to the light you have already received, because we see imperfectly in mortality. Not everything is going to make sense right now. In fact, I should think that if everything did make sense to us, it would be evidence that it had all been made up by a mortal mind. Remember that God has said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Nevertheless, you know that one of the purposes of mortality is to become more like your Heavenly Father in your thoughts and in your ways. Viewed from this perspective, searching for answers to your questions can bring you closer to God, strengthening your testimony instead of shaking it. It's true that faith is not a perfect knowledge, but as you exercise your faith, applying gospel principles every day under any circumstances, Apply those principles wherever you are and whenever it is. You will taste the sweet fruits of the gospel. And by this fruit, you will know of its truth. Fantastic. Thank you, Elder Uchtdorf. That's great stuff. And may each of you stay close to the true sources of light and follow the example that we have in the ancient prophets. We see what joy it brings them even during times of trial. Absolutely. Brethren and sisters, adieu. Adieu. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>